Okay, hello and welcome to the podcast where today I am very, very pleased indeed to have Julie Travis with me. Now, Julie is, uh, I'm probably going to actually ask you to explain yourself, Julie, but I would introduce you as a horror writer <laughs> yeah. and, and perhaps an artist as well. Would that be a fair, um, is that how you describe yourself? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a nice way of putting it. Um, I do a bit of photography. Okay. And, I suppose actually over the years I have done mucked about with art, doing fanzines and stuff, but um, I'm not amazingly adept at it. But it's just winging it really. But I enjoy doing it. Oh, uh, aren't we all? Layout, layout and that with fanzines, it can be very much a, you know, just sticking things in places and see where it looks. But that's probably as uh, as highbrow as I get. Well, art doesn't have to be highbrow, does it? I suppose. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay, so where I normally start and where I'd like to start today is in your upbringing. So what I'm interested in is a bit of background um, and, and perhaps specifically regarding how, the bits of that background that you think might have made you the person you are today. I suppose all of it does to an extent, but you know yeah. what I mean? The, the things that were kind of influential in that. So can you tell us about, you know, growing up? Well, I think I think the main thing is is really that I'm an ident I've got an identical twin sister. That's been something that it's weird because I'm I'm 55 now and I still haven't really got used to it. Um, I think maybe it's because the way you're treated is is quite weird. When you when you're really young, we were dressed quite similarly to each other. And for a while, that oh, you can't tell one from the other was quite funny. But as I got a little bit older, it started getting quite annoying. So I think, and it, you know, it's nobody's fault, but I've spent a lot of my life trying to establish my own identity, I think, which is probably how it goes for a lot of identical twins. So from what I've read, they either go one way, in which case they're happy to, you know, be a mirror image of each other, or they do have to fight for some individuality. Um, so I did have issues with um, you know, identity, I suppose, and individuality. But I grew up, we lived in a house in Ruislip Manor, which is a suburb of North West London. And it was oh, probably like quite similar to where you was. Um, it just soulless really um but not not particularly nice i think it was full of basically white people that had made good and moved out of the city a little bit um but i just i remember my childhood as just being quite scary a lot of it because um there was just so many weirdos around. <laughs> you know what I mean? The whole stranger danger thing. You know, obviously that's that's nothing new. Okay, with the internet age, okay, these weirdos coming into people into kids' homes really to try and get them. But it was you know old school style weirdos would be the bloke in the park that <laughs> I remember two of my friends being asked to lift their skirts up so he could take a photograph of it, and they actually did it. I mean, I wasn't there, but because children have to do what adults say that's that's what it was like in those days and um, so it was there was a lot of episodes of that um i do believe the house i grew up in was haunted because it was just it was a very unquiet place so i didn't i didn't particularly see childhood as a particularly safe time although i think the couple of really good things was that one of my neighbors they had three three kids and we were all good friends and their garden was just a complete mess there was sand pits and that everywhere it was like an adventure playground and it was always a really good place to go and I did enjoy a lot of family holidays because we would go down to Lyme Regis and go fossil hunting which is something we were all completely mad about so like, geeking about on holiday every year was really good um, but apart from that yes I, I can't say I I enjoyed being uh, a child. I think as well because you just got so little 
um, control over what happens and what you do. You know, it's which is the sort of the way it has to be, really. But I didn't enjoy it, so. Curious about what you said about your neighbour's garden because I think that really chimed with me because I think um, when you're that when you're a young child, by which I mean you know primary school age or, or whatever, um, there's a real magic to kind of wild places, even if it is just the untidiness of a garden. Yes. And and I think we sort of perhaps we lose that as we strive for order a bit more as we have to strive for order to pay the bills or whatever I guess but um but yeah I think it's really nice to sort of remember that and being an identical twin this isn't something I've ever had to think about in all honesty but um did uh, when you were young were you actually difficult to tell apart oh yes yeah I mean there were plenty of photographs where I didn't have a clue or I'd spend ages looking at it to see which one was me um Luckily, my parents didn't have a problem. <laughs> there was never, never any issue. And I, I don't, I'm not sure if we ever took advantage of that pretending to be the other person. Um, and it can, it's a mixed blessing, really, because in some ways it's good because you do sort of protect each other. And you've always got someone to talk to if, you know, no one's hanging around you, with you at school. But, um, but that same thing can be something that it just gets... You get so introverted that you can't sort of look outwards enough, which is probably why I, I sort of broke away as soon as I could, because I just needed to, I needed to see who I was, really. Mm, I could imagine, yeah. But you, you often sort of read about identical twins having almost supernatural connections. Did you find that your connection with your sister was perhaps closer than than you saw in other people's non-twins sort of siblings yeah, i think so and i think as i say some of that was was kind of forced on us really but it's that whole thing as well being referred to as the twins so it was like you're one entity between you um so yeah in a way but also i think i think it just naturally happens if two people are in the same space for quite a long time because we're we're we still connect pretty well, but obviously it's not the same because we've grown up and had different lives. But I think sometimes with with I was been with a couple of partners, I've had that sort of closest that you can really read each other. So I think I don't know. I think it's more that than anything genetic, I suppose. Mm, mm. That's really interesting. So um, moving on a little bit, then what was school like? Um, absolutely dreadful. It was, oh my God, uh, I'm writing a story right now, actually, where the first thing that happens in it is this, this 16 year old girl walks out of her school and the place just collapses behind her. The whole building just falls apart, which of course is a complete wishful thinking, I think in my own life. Or maybe it, it's just a, a metaphor for the place ceasing to, to matter once you're walking out the school gates for the last time. But I, I found it really baffling actually, because all the way through, even at junior school, you had some teachers that were, were terrible bullies, really nasty, um, actually, and, and allowed some of the boys to go around and harass people at the end of school break times. It was, I just never understood why it was so, it was so bad. But I did academically, I did really well until I got to secondary school. Um, and, and then there's just too many other things going on. Um, you, you spend so much time worrying about the, the, the people that you had to avoid. I'm sure there's, there's some people that did have quite a, a reasonable time at school. But I absolutely hated it. But again, being being a pair of punk twins is you stand out like a sore thumb. So you're going to be a magnet for everyone that wants to push anyone around. And because I was brought up not to fight back, I do think if I just punched the first girl that had a go at me, I probably would have had a much easier life, which is really bad to say, but um, 
it's probably true. So I didn't enjoy school. I was very good at English language. Um, I was good at PE. I was in the school team for hockey and netball, I think, maybe rounders. So that was quite fun. But the rest of it, uh, I, I did I did thoroughly enjoy leaving at the uh, first opportunity. And it was a, a thing in my school where all the all the leavers were invited to like a lunch on the last day. And absolutely everyone in my year at school went except me and my sister. Because we said, no, we don't like you and you don't like us. And we just walked out the gate and went home. And it was brilliant. I'm really glad I did that. And I did put my, uh, I did burn my school uniform, all my exercise books, absolutely everything. So yes, that was cool. And actually, to be honest, I think one of the reasons that I never became a parent is that I couldn't, I, there's no way I could force a child if, to go to school because I'd had such a bad experience of it. And also I think as well, my parents both hated school. So they were understanding. They were quite, quite good about letting me skive off sometimes because they just, they just knew how bad it was. So, but I, I don't know too many people that have enjoyed their school yet. So, I think uh, yeah, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, not not on a podcast, just in uh, in real life, as they say. And they were saying it's very different today. But I think for our generation, I think that's so much of what you said chimes with me because. Um, you were in northwest London, I was in South East London, but they are kind of geographically they're kind of in the same place but 180 yeah. degrees, aren't they? And um and I hated I'd love primary school, I hated secondary school. It was not a nice place at all, my school. And um and I yeah, and I consequently I kind of messed up. Well, if you call it messed up, I left school without the qualifications I was expected to get when I'd started, that's for sure. I think it's very much those times. You know, I think there was, uh, they were pretty kind of grim times anyway, the late 70s, early 80s. And I think those times kind of, I think so many people would have similar experiences to us in that kind of situation, really. Do you know anybody from school? Um, No, no. Uh, I mean, I, I did have a couple of friends and we sort of went to the same parties for a very short time after after we all left school but i just lost touch with everyone because it was just it was it was just too much although um something my brother did because he's three years older than me and my sister and went to the same school uh he actually found the facebook page of the school we all went to and he was brave enough to post on it saying all these people saying how much they love their school days, it was crap, it was horrible, and there were so many bullies everywhere. And then you found that a lot of people actually joined that conversation to say, oh, you weren't the only one. They were, you know, there's there's loads of us here. And from that, someone, uh, one of the people I did hang around with actually got in touch and said, oh, are you Julian Yvette's brother? So she sort of said hello, but only sort of vaguely. But it's it nice to know that she's still kicking around, but... It's just not somewhere, not somewhere I'd want to go back to at all, in any mm. shape or form. Yeah, that, that, very similar with my school. Actually, I looked it up, and there's a page, just a, a, and it somebody made a web page about it, and all these comments were all very sort of cheery, and um, and it was okay, and apart from the occasional kind of speculation on who was a pedo in the teachers and all that sort of stuff, but um, <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, there is this sort of normality, isn't there? I remember when uh, Friends Reunited came out and that you check people via schools, doesn't it? That's how you found them on that. And um, and everybody seemed to sort of live in Welling and have two kids in, in my particular school's case. And you just thought no one, no one's kind of, this is not how normality looks, you know. But it's... <laughs> The only people posting were the people who had two kids and lived in Welling. It was quite, quite dark the way it kind of pushed people into this kind of enforced or pretend normality, really. But one one friend of mine um, did did put, I'm, I'm living on the side of the A4 in a broken down caravan or something like that, which I thought was quite cool. But yeah, OK, so did punk rock happen uh, for you at school? Was, was that 
when you were at school. Yeah, and and this was probably like a, a cliche, or so many people say it, but yes, it, I think it saved a lot of us. Really, it it needed to happen for so many reasons. Um, I mean, I was in 1976, 77, and I would have been nine, ten years old, so I was very young for it. But I do remember reading about the Sex Pistols a lot in the papers, and my mm -hmm. brother managed to get hold of a bootleg tape of one of their gigs, and I was just completely besotted with them really I, I literally went overnight from being a massive Bay City Rolls fan to suddenly thinking the Stranglers you know X-ray specs the Sex Pistols suddenly because I wrote in my diary that I was having a dilemma over whether I like the Stranglers more than the Bay City Rollers and then a few days later I made I made that decision I like the Stranglers more and that was it the end of childhood really but it, it was, it was completely amazing. And again, another cliche has been said so many times, but polystyrene was, was absolutely a massive, massive influence. She was so inspiring because she just, she would look odd, you know, she wore braces on her teeth like I did. She, well, she wasn't white, so she was different. Uh, and she dressed really, really strangely. And the stuff uh, that she was singing about was actually really serious stuff, but, but approached in a really, a really different angle, I think, the, the take she had on it. So, yeah, and at the time I was actually, I was a skateboarder as well. So it, it sort of felt like the two got incorporated because we were, because we couldn't afford to buy our own proper skateboards. We'd get the trucks and wheels. And my dad would help us make skateboard decks and then we'd sort of decorate them and listen to punk while we were skating. So it all sort of got completely incorporated. Um, uh, yes, it was brilliant, I think. Um, I really don't think you can underestimate the power of, of what punk did, I don't think so. And uh, I do have to say that, because so many people slag off John Lydon, and I say, oh, he talks about this and that, how much he likes Trump. I think the bloke's absolutely brilliant for what he's done. Um, I, I don't always like what PIL are doing, but I don't think that matters. He's just been completely honest and completely groundbreaking. So I think he's, uh, but again, yeah, I'm not sure I'd want to bump into him, but, you know. Yeah, it's funny. I've got a list, well, a very small list, really, of people I don't really want to meet because I just think the only way would be down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, yeah, he... He did. He changed my life as well, really. Being interviewed on London Weekend Show, and I can't remember the exact words, but basically saying, "Yeah, you know, it's your life, and you don't have to follow the rules, and uh, you don't have to go out and get a job in a bank or or whatever." That to, no one had ever said that sort of stuff. Um, not when I was listening, anyway. So, yeah, really, really refreshing. And that line in Pretty Bacon, "Don't pretend because I don't care," and I thought. Oh, that's brilliant. That is just so, you know, this I sort of is my respect for him just just went massively up the longer I listened to, you know, the pistols and then and then PIL come out and they were so different again. Yeah, I some big respect to him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And was your sister into it as well? Were you getting oh, into yeah, it together? Yeah. And your brother as well, by the sound of it. Yeah, so you had quite, quite the punk family. Yeah. Yeah, I know we all played together in the band at one time as well. If we were better, we could have been like the Osmonds, but there you go. But because <laughs> he was three years older, he got he had a job in the civil service and he'd get his pay packet every Friday. And sometimes he'd he'd come home with records for me and my sister, which was really nice of him, actually. So he was bringing home all this punk stuff. That's how I got this uh, the Joy Division atmosphere 12 inch, because he brought it home for us one one week. It was this fantastic but he was getting all these records and he was going to a lot of the gigs you know with saw Susie and the Banshees at some tiny little venue in Camden and he, he went and saw Crass so it was, he was lucky being just that little bit older he could do that so it was pretty much yes yeah, like a family thing really so what did you do when you left school um I seem to remember having a, a chat with the, with the careers officer at school and saying, what did I want to do? And I said, I want to be in a band. 
which of course is actually what I just started doing. I think I started plunking around in a bass guitar. Um, and the bloke told me not to be so unrealistic and suggested I get a job delivering flowers. <laughs> just really <laughs> strange, based on absolutely nothing. Right. But what I did do actually um, was I was on the dole for a year. I, so I was doing fanzines. And because we, me and my sister were in the band, we, we were doing that and just mucking about really and just doing things and, and actually beginning for about the first year and then started hanging out in Stoke Newington with all the all the dirty punk squatters. But it was just doing stuff that was just not hanging around Rislip Manor and talking about how great school days were, which is what um, I think ex-classmates seem to be doing. Well, tell me about the fanzines. What, what was that? Um, actually, the first scene me and my sister worked on was actually a skateboard one. And this was just way back, must have been 76 or 77. But it was sort of more like a scrapbook because we didn't have our own stuff. But we did sort of put it together and write stuff for it. Um, and then probably about 81, 82, we did about two or three issues of a zine called The Only Alternative, which was... Well, us, we'd actually managed to interview quite a few people by post. Um, who was it? The Mob, Blood and Roses, Newton Erotics. I actually ended up doing a couple of interviews with them. So we had some good people in it, but um, woeful graphics. <laughs> but it was great because my dad actually took took the things to work and um, used, his, used the photocopier there and come back with, you know, 30 copies. So it was very, very supportive. And then I went on to, uh, to I did do the one issue of We Will Storm the Palace, meet, meet Me at the Gates. So that was probably the last one I did. So that was the mid eighties. And then of course, a couple of years ago, I did Dyke Scene, which was actually really, really fun to do. The early one, where did you sell it? How did you? Get it out there. Um, I would put an advert in sounds because that was for how uh, loads of people sort of got their zines. I used to buy zines from that. So you get people writing to you with like 50p stuck to an envelope or something. So that was that was good. Uh, also was going to gigs with them because that was always a good, well, it was a good way to sort of vaguely talk to people and mm, mm. handing out flyers or whatever. So... Yeah, yeah, just just that whole word of mouth thing. I think possibly might have had a few copies for sale in Rough Trade as well, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Rough Trade was actually a really, really good sort of community hub, I thought. Because I there was a, at one point I was going there literally, I think every Saturday, and just hanging out looking at records and zines and checking. I actually got Ian Asprey's uh, address from the notice board at Rough Trade. I wrote to him, and actually, because I wanted to interview Southern Death Cult, but he wrote back and said that they just split up and the Death Cult was forming out of, you know, the remains of it and to do an interview then. But I think I, uh, I think I sort of lost interest when it became the Death Cult. It just got a little bit sort of rocky to me, whereas actually I was watching, I was watching some footage of Southern Death Cult the other day and it's very, very like, Adam and the Ants when they were still interesting, really. A lot of parallels, I think. Great live band, Southern Death Cult, I thought. I wish I'd seen them. Oh, yeah. did you? Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. Real, there was a real power that they never really caught on their record. Uh, I don't think. But yeah, there was something really quite visceral and almost feral about it. But the record was a bit polished to me, really. I, I, I was quite surprised because he sounded a bit like Tony Hadley to me on the record. And, oh, yeah, actually. That's. Um, yeah, I wasn't really expecting that from from the gigs, I suppose. But um, there's a really, really good John Peel demo out there that sounds mm. like they did sound live, um, which I discovered I don't know, the last year or something like that. Southern Death Cult, I mean, it takes me back. Uh, very much of its time, all that kind oh, of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, What's your sister doing then? You're, you're kind of you moved into the Stoke Newington squatting 
melee. And yeah. what did your sister do? Well, she was uh, she she still lived at home with our parents. She didn't. I don't think she moved out till she was about twenty five ish. Okay. Um, and we were we were still working together as she was she was a drummer, uh, and I was bassist in the the Joy of Living. So we was we were still doing that. So we we're still hanging out a lot. So yeah, tell um, me about the band. Um, well, there were various incarnations. Um, we was mucking about in a friend's garage for ages, doing what was what we hoped was something sounding like the Southern Death Cult, which was just probably <coughs> probably just a really horrible noise. Because we would uh, when we did band rehearsals, you'd, after a little while, you get people banging on the on the garage door, just begging us to stop. <laughs> because of course, you know, there's no sound through. But we couldn't afford a rehearsal studio. So that was a lot of early mucking about. We did, uh, I think we recorded a couple of tracks, but only like on a portable cassette player. But after that, me and my sister and my brother actually very briefly started The Joy of Living and we got other people involved. Um, the I think the, the tapes that I've still got, you can think, well, we had a, a couple of half decent tunes but no real direction. And I think that's where it just wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, but saying that after we split up and um, me and Yvette and Sharon, who was one of the singers, um, were invited to, to be on an EP with Andy Martin and you know, the Apostles. And that was, that was, I think the biggest, for me, that was really massive. Because the apostles have been been really, really, uh, again another inspiration. I started writing to Andy Martin when I was still at school because he was as angry as I felt. So <laughs> he was proper angry. He was even angrier than Crass, but Crass would sometimes have a sense of humour, and I couldn't deal with that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a real high point because he had he had a song that wasn't workable really for the apostles so him and dave and me that sharon all worked together on ended up doing five tracks actually so four songs from joy living and his one and it, as far as i was concerned i was it was i was happy just mucking about playing the song in uh in his house in hackney what was the record called uh death to wacky pop <laughs> Uh, but Andy said, well, he'd spoken to Colin Jerwood of Conflict, who, of course, had the North Hate label and Fight Back. And Colin said we could put together a, a record for it. So wasn't going to say no to that. Must have been quite a thrill to see the oh, It was massive. It was massive. Um, the, I don't know, the recording went... The recording went quite well, I think, but I, there's so much that I didn't know then. You know, Andy and Dave, were, they were mixing the one track, really, that Andy had written, so he was concentrating on that. And you could see they just knew exactly what they were doing, and and we were just mucking about. Because so, <laughs> the, the thing is, you don't actually really know what what does what. You were hoping for suggestions from the engineer if they're, you know, if they're good. Mm. Because it was just the once, so... You make mistakes, but at the same time, I'm, I'm really, really chuffed that I did it. And we sort of forgot about it for ages because, um, I suppose because I, I didn't have even have a record player, so I couldn't even play the copy that I had. But then Mortal Hate started, did, do, did a, a compilation of all the singles on CD, and that was on it as well, as were Flowers in the Dustbin. And uh, many, many other, uh, well, most of the rest of them were quite shouty sound alikes, really. Um, and then once the internet really happened, I started seeing reviews of, of the single and it for sale on eBay for like 25 quid, which I thought was bizarre, really. And people writing about, about it as well, saying, oh, I really like this. Um, so it was like finally after decades we got some feedback from it really, because we had no idea where, if anyone even bought it at the time. You know, we didn't get any information back from 
from Colin. So yeah, yeah no idea. No one thought that all these years later we'd be talking about it, did they? That's for sure, you know. It's... Yes, oh, absolutely. And I suppose there is a there seems to be a real market for for all the the DIY stuff in the eighties. I suppose because they've got very short print runs. Yeah, there's not that many of them about, so they're really collectible. But I yeah, I had no sense of in that way. It was good because I was so completely living in the moment. It didn't occur to me that like in the future people would even remember that any of this had happened. So it's, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So then you sort of go, you dive into the Stoke News and squatting scene. And how long were you involved in that? When, when was that as well, I suppose? Um, oh, it would have been about 1985, I think. Um, so I was hanging around a lot and um, almost moved into one of the squats. But frankly, my mum, my mum wouldn't let me. <laughs> but I was still like young enough to to have to listen to it. So it's probably the right thing for her to do, actually, because it's, it's such an insecure life, really. You never know when you're just going to go home and find, you know, your stuff's out on the street. Uh, Not a great yeah. way to live. But I did I did go to see loads of bands. Um, so it was it was really great in that respect. And, you know, I did do an awful lot and, and hang around in, in Hackney as well. I'd, I'd go over to, to Andy's house and hang out with him. It was just, it was, it was for the most part, I mean, there's some really bad moments, but uh, for the most part, it was really good, I think. And so we've moved into kind of whole anarcho punk thing more than yes. the, more than the sort of original Stranglers, X-ray spec stuff that we were talking about before, really, I suppose. So how did you find that? Was that somewhere you naturally gravitated to? Yeah, I think so, because, um, you know, I knew people that were involved in it. Um, I'd started seeing some of the bands and this is where, you know, that's where they were. Uh, and it was just, it, again, it was, a, I think, a, a way of stepping away from where I was brought up to yeah. somewhere well, a bit more, a bit more dangerous, I suppose, because in those days, Stoke Newington was pretty, was a lot more rough. It's all, it's all gentrified now, but yes, I gather, yeah, yeah. And would this be around the time you came out as gay then? No, no, that was uh, that was a long time after, actually. I was it. Um, I ended up where was I? I went to live in Kensal Green for a long time. Um, um, I did have a male partner, and uh, it just just became more and more apparent that uh, I think I think I'd always knew I was a lesbian, but you can't you can't um, vocalise it. I think when you're young, and I think especially back then, it was really it was a lot more dodgy to do. So you don't know whether your family are gonna yeah uh, blame you. I do know an awful lot of people um, who lost that entire family when we came out. They just, um, it was it was awful. So it took me until about 1994. Okay. And I just couldn't, um, I couldn't sort of pretend to be anything else anymore. And the partner I was with, well, I, I told him that I was, I'd come out to him um, and basically he, uh, well, just refusing to accept it. Let's just say it wasn't good. Um, but when I, I, again, there was a final push for that as well, and it was looking at Time Out magazine. And I saw this tiny photograph of a band called Sister George, who were a queer core band. Um, and I just looked and I thought, oh my God, I need to be a part of that because it just looked so exciting and it looked right. Because there was the whole stereotype of the gay scene as just being you know, disco bunny stuff. So almost the first thing I did when I um, when I came out, I moved back into Stoke Newton because I just found a room in a flat there very easily. And I went to a Sister George gig because they were playing around the corner a couple of weeks later. And it 
I just thought this is amazing. You know, the the gay punks all over the place. So I felt like, but in a, it didn't seem in a very nostalgic way, but but more in a being on the outside of the outside, if that makes sense. Mm, now because it does. The yeah. whole the whole gay establishment was really quite. It, it offered nothing really. It was just sitting around in expensive coffee bars in Soho and. Um, it's just dull. So the whole, the punk angle was just completely where I was, you know, where I was at. So You describing that sounds very similar to when you described getting into punk to me, actually. Yes. Yeah, actually, yes, very, very much. Uh, yeah, the next stage of, evil, of my own evolution, I suppose. Mm. Um, and I, who knows? I mean, I suppose I would have had to come out anyway because... I suppose probably with most most people, you just can't carry on as you are. Um, but it would have been a lot more difficult had this lot, this lot of bands not ex not existed. And actually, of course, I found out afterwards. I remember, or I remembered afterwards that there was originally came from Homo Core, which was in America. Um, but the apostles were seen as as a bit of the fathers of Homo Core. Um, um, although I don't think I don't, Andy wouldn't want to be, <laughs> it's not his bag at all. But but Dave was very openly bisexual. Um, Andy would would was queer in some ways, but or you know didn't want to really commit to being that. But he he'd stated that that was a, a bit of an issue with him, and he said once they put that on the record. It's lost an awful lot of fans because because the, the band had basically come out, so they'd had their own troubles with it. Because, again, punk was so conservative in a lot of ways. It really was. Because mm. you, you think, well, these people that are supposed to be so outside the box, they hear that they're the punk band they like isn't straight isn't full of straight people, why would that be a problem? It's just weird. I don't understand it. It is weird, isn't it? And it's not exactly like a new thing for people in the music business to be homosexual, is it, really? You know, it's, it, it was going on for a little while before punk, I think. So Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to sort of get onto the storytelling a bit now, or the writing stories, um, I should say. So where does that fit in in the timeline? When did you kind of start becoming the horror writer you are now? Um, I suppose it probably started when I was very young because my whole family were into were into horror films. We, you know, we some of our favourite TV viewing was sitting around watching Hammer films. It just seemed to be on the telly all the time. They were great. And there were my parents had a lot of um, horror anthologies. Uh, most of it were very sort of uh, quite staid Victorian gothic stuff. But I did find a lot, a lot of good things in there, some amazing stories. Um, so I was watching films and I think I, I still, it wouldn't have completely occurred to me to write until Clive Barker appeared because I'd gone off horror a little bit before then because there were all these films coming out that seemed to be at least very sexist, if not misogynist. You had women, because they live alone, they get stalked and murdered. And there were so many films like that, it really put me off. But Clive Barker's Books of Blood appeared. And, and it, for me, it was like post-punk writing, really, because you had really strong female characters, which, of course, gave me something to relate to. And I thought, well, horror is savable then. Um, and then I just thought, I don't know, I just wanted to start writing. So once I'd, I'd, I'd actually stopped playing music and I, know, I can't remember, maybe a year or a couple of years of drifting, really, not sure what I was going to do. I started writing horror stories. It just seemed to make sense to do it. So where, where do you go? I mean, you, you have this urge to write horror stories, but in terms of actually getting anyone to read them, mm. um, I'm kind of guessing you're probably a bit in the dark, <laughs> in the dark about that. <laughs> the darkness. At, um, 
at the time, um, there was quite, you're talking about the early-ish 1990s, there was actually a really good network of independent um, horror magazines and fanzines. So it's like the whole fanzine thing, but done with, but with fiction in it. Um, so again, it was, uh, you could go over to Forbidden Planet and pick up all this stuff. So again, luckily being in London, there was a point of contact where you could go in and actually find things. Um, so, and, and just adverts in other magazines of, uh, of, of, of horror magazines or fan scenes. So after a while, I just, I started sending stories off and some of them got some quite um, quite uh, powerful rejections, you know, as in quite nasty. But then someone paid me 60 quid for a story, which, you know, well, back then, in fact, even now, I'm not happy to get 60 quid for a story, but back then it just felt like a fortune. Mm. Um, and then that came out in a magazine called REM. Um, <coughs> and that story was reviewed in Interzone, which as uh, you're probably aware of, it's probably the biggest science fiction magazine in the country. Um, and it got completely slated. I mean, it was really, I mean, the, the, the story was quite uh, naive and shocking, but I thought it was all over. This bloke was calling me the next Myra Hindley and uh, just completely over the top. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I thought, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? I really wasn't sure. Mm. But from it's that, a it, thing, certainly. Um, but from there, of course, and in InDesign, they they had adverts for other for other independent magazines and things. So it was just a matter of again trial and error, really. And so then, sorry. Um, I was lucky to find a magazine called The Third Alternative, um, which had just started up. It's now known as Black Static. Um, I don't know whether it's still going. It may possibly have just ended, but that became the biggest horror magazine in, in Britain and with a really, really good reputation. So I was in about the third or the fourth issue of that because uh, they'd taken a story of mine um, which actually had been completely influenced just by playing um, a coil album on repeat for like months, uh, Horse Rotivator, which is probably a very influential album for a lot of reasons. Um, and it got published in The Third Alternative and the response was really, really amazing. It's quite overwhelming. Um, so from then I just, just kept going really. It sounds like there's a kind of a whole indie scene not dissimilar to punk actually around yeah, the I think, I think there was uh, that kind of attitude for a lot of it. Although I have to say, um, I did certainly the UK scene, I did have some problems with it uh, to the point where I just stopped um, sending stories anywhere in Britain because I actually found sort of some real homophobia. Uh, um, so I just found it really disturbing and I didn't really want anything to do with the British small press for a while. So I was getting a lot of stuff published in North America. We seem to be a lot more open. But then after about 10 years, I sort of dipped my toe in the water and, and saw what the UK um, press was like again. And actually the community had got a lot better, a bit more clued up. So I just... Uh, well, by then, of course, there were forums online, so I could start connecting with a few other people. To a lot of um, to a lot of people, I would think horror perhaps begins and ends with Hammer Horror, and maybe the sort of better I don't know Nightmare on Elm Street and all that kind of stuff. But I've read your stuff, and it's not like that in the slightest. Really, to me, it's almost more like tales of the unexpected or something like that sort of spooky rather than kind of a gore fest would that be a fair comment yes yes but i think when i started out there was definitely there was definitely a lot more gore 
I think it was it was probably probably under the more the under the splatter punk umbrella really which was a thing for a while but I soon got a bit tired of it because I thought there's going to be there's a lot more interesting things to explore um so and I started looking a lot towards the the dreams and nightmares I was having so I've, I've moved away from that and so I think really it's a lot more surrealist I think um but yeah a bit more subtle I think that's always good. <laughs> well, you can be extreme. You can just you can just uh, use different channels for it. I think put it in a different way. I want to try and get into what kind of goes on in your head, and um, you know why you write horror rather than Mills and Boone novels or or whatever. Um, but it's quite it's quite a sort of tough one to sort of know where to to start really. But you've said your parents had horror books and you read them etc i guess that i guess that's a, a starting point isn't it um did you actually make a conscious decision to do that or was it just obviously the thing to do i want to to write horror um yeah to go into horror rather than romance or adventure or i, I, I think because because it had been a, a pretty much lifelong obsession really or interest um Again, I use some of the experiences of the house I was brought up in, um, because that that was it was it was a scary place. Um, I still I don't know why all that stuff was happening. I don't know the history of the house. Uh, I mean, I was having nightmares about that house for about ten years after I left. I was that scared. I would never have walked even past that house again. So I had all that influences. Um, I think, yeah, horror was the only way I could sort of express what was going on. Also, um, much later on, I found out that I, because I do have um, some reasonably long term mental health problems, that is also, it's another way to channel all of that, I think, because obviously there's a lot of negative thoughts or with depression, but if you can push it into a more constructive way, um, you can, I suppose, you can help yourself with it. But I've also, I mean, I've had some feedback from people saying that they, it's it's made them feel better about their own issues because it's stuff that they can relate to. Uh, and I know it's it's on you know, mental health is a lot talked about an awful lot more these days, and I think it's it's more acknowledged, which which is really good. It needs to be because I think we're at ec epidemic proportions of it now. Um, so it wasn't so much back then. Yeah, maybe. I mean, certainly when stuff is in the subconscious and in the imagination, it has much more power than when you shine a light on it. Yeah. So perhaps in shining a light on it in your stories, that's perhaps therapeutic. Yeah, and I think as well because I was, I didn't really know how to be happy because I think because school had been so awful um, and then you'd get, time off from school and a lot of the time I wouldn't even leave the house because I was scared of running into any of the school bullies um so there was a it was just an awful lot of of negativity really which I think added to how I, how I was feeling um but horror seems like a really good way of just channeling of channeling really bad energy mm -hmm. you talked about a sort of homophobic reaction to your writing is that because is that because your writing is chock full of lesbians or just because they knew you were a lesbian or... <laughs> well actually i don't think i don't think it was about um i don't think it was about anything that i'd written i think it was just on these forums people would discuss various aspects of writing and i came across some really shocking attitudes um with people assuming gay men were all paedophiles and you know those, those old those old, old um, nasty stereotypes which aren't actually true um, and I, I just found it shocking um, mm. and also I think one writer I won't mention his name but very very if it's who I think it was is a very very high profile British science fiction writer uh, equated being gay to dogs fucking in the street 
I mean, that was his, I, that's a quote from what she said to me online. So after that, I just thought, I'm stepping away. This is nothing, this is not my scene at all, is it? No, I don't blame you. Was it a bit of a boys' club then? Um, I think so. I mean, saying that, I mean, things have changed a lot. And it, there have been editors <laughs> such as Andy Cox from um, The Third Alternative who would actually actively promote female writers. He's always been really good for that. So all credit to him. But I think it, even now there's, there's issues. Um, for instance, with the new Candyman film that's come out in the last year or so. Um, I don't know whether you've seen it, but it it's sets the story in the projects in, I can't remember which part of America, but it's, it's a deprived area. And so it's, it's got a lot of black people in it because, you know, why wouldn't it? And you get these horror fans that really hated the film, saying, "Well, we don't, we don't need politics in it." And actually, no, it's not. It's not politics. It's just a setting in a, a place where people are not who don't look exactly like you exist. It's okay. And actually, yes, there's a there was even a, a gay black man in it, so that was it was too much. But I thought, how can you possibly? be so sort of blinkered to stuff like that, especially when you're talking about a Clive Barker story. I mean, Clive Barker's been very, very out for decades now. So I, again, I, I just don't understand it at all. But I think the boys club is slowly being sort of pushed aside because I do, I still see male, male editors that are actively trying to promote some sort of diversity. So I think it's changing, but that, I think, I suppose as well, it just reflects society yeah. um, in general, really. It's, it's all the same, isn't it, really? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So tell me about your writing now. Well, you were talking with me uh, in another time, well, on, on another occasion, um, about one of your stories being perhaps made into a film. Um, so would you like to sort of see it go that way with you films it's it's something i've um i've done a lot of wishful thinking about it but because i've been actually working on the screenplay this year you can i can just see what a massive massive job it is so i i realistically i'm not sure it could ever happen but at the same time i want one of the achievements i really want to have is to have got a screenplay written, even if it never goes anywhere. Because uh, while well, I've been told my stories are quite cinematic, and I suppose the way I, I write them is almost like scenes from a film. I mean, I'm not one of those people that think the only thing that's, you know, writing fiction is like a stepping stone to having an adaptation, because it's a completely different medium. But, um, yeah, I'd love to see something like that. It'd be really interesting, but it's it's such a process. So I don't know, but if someone can just magic it for me, that would be really good. Wow, but you're when, living in that world. When I talked about it a very long time ago, I discussed the story with this bloke, and um, he said, said basically that the you know the details I gave him, the what the production company was after was a bit more of a slice and dice gore fest so and what I was writing was I did already stepped away from that so in a way that was sort of a compliment I suppose but so it, it didn't really come to anything but it was a nice idea how would you describe your stories then to sort of some random dude on the street um there's a lot of magical realism what's in, that um, well, just magic and strange things as part of everyday life. Um, yeah, so I would say it was mostly set in the real world or the real world with a slight, with a few twists and turns in it. Because I think we are, we're never very far away from I know, the paranormal or the supernatural and sorts of things. There's a lot of things that I think that we don't know. We've forgotten to see what's going on around us. 
but I think it's it's very there. Um, and I think moving down to Cornwall is has really proved that. I you get a lot of you know hippie types here, but there's a reason there's a reason for it really because you go to a lot of these sacred sites and there is an energy there. I mean, it's, it's sort of does manifest itself, but it, it's it's an energy that's that I think is lost in other places because they've been so overdeveloped. That I think it's I couldn't really connect with that stuff in London. Although there is a lot of it, so yes, I'd say I'd say real life, but with a few steps to one side. Let's talk about that move from London to Cornwall because it seems to me there's an awful lot. Like I say, with COVID, people seem to want to move out of London and or, or cities in general, really. I suppose, and you've gone for it. I don't know, and so have I, but you've gone for it more. You're you're kind of. You're a bigger yokel than I am. Yes. Super yokel. Um, so yeah, t- tell me about the differences between between Stoke Newington and Cornwall. Yeah. Um, I think because when I left, things were getting very very heavy. Um, I was in Clapton, um, which was absolutely really really rough. There was a lot of shootings, load of drugs. Um, turf wars and that that sort of thing going on. Um, so it was it was nasty, and I, I thought this none of this stuff involved me. But you're still there, and you can still be caught in a crossfire. Um, and I would go home and and on the bus uh, from work, and and you'd see another area would have been taped off by the police because there'd been another shooting. And there was one night I, I was walking home from a club. And this bloke ran past me on the other side of the road holding a gun. And I thought, well, there's nothing, he clearly meant me no harm, but it was it just summed up how, how bad things had got, I think, in London. So I was lucky that my parents had moved from there about a year or so before, because of course they were still in, they were in Harrow at the time. Um, so they managed to buy this house down just outside St. Ives. And I'd, I'd split up with my then partner as well. So I spent that year going backwards and forwards, really thinking, can I actually make this move? Have I got the guts to do it? Because, of course, I, I did I still have a lot of friends in London, I had a lot of connections. Um, but it was like there was a lot of things that ended, that relationship had ended. I was in the Lesbian Avengers, which was also good fun. That had fallen in on itself. Um, Queer core was was pretty much over with, um, and the the gay scene was sort of back to as it was before. Just a load of you know beautiful people sitting in bars, and which just didn't interest me. So it was all the signs were there to just leave, you know. Um, and because of, there was, I suppose as well, a lot of the artists and musicians that I really respected, they they didn't live in London, so you don't have to be in London to do good stuff. You know, it's because, of course, I probably still had a lot of that London bias. You know, we, you know, it's the centre of the universe, history, which is, which it isn't. It really isn't. Um, Apparently less so nowadays, very much. Mm. So everyone tells me. Yeah. So my parents had a, there a room spare at their house. And, and Cornwall seemed like a brilliant place to go. Which it has been. So it didn't take you that. For a long. lesbian, though, um, or for you, basically. But, you know, when you sort of moved down to Cornwall, did you sort of think, I'm leaving somewhere with an established gay scene and I'm not sure what's going to be available, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, there, there was definitely that. Um, but also, it was, they didn't really bother me. Um, when I came down here, it, it took me a while to start sort of trying to find new friends and that but but for the main part and because i've got had actually got really ill again um i was i think probably heading for another full-on breakdown because i'd had one a few years before and i was i was just messing up a lot of work because i couldn't focus properly it was getting so that i couldn't leave the house i'd get on the bus to work and i'd have to jump off and walk home so it was all becoming very claustrophobic so as well for the sake of my health I knew that if I had a chance to get out that I really should have done 
And luckily my parents moved somewhere really interesting. <laughs> But so I didn't really see a, a lack of a uh, you know like a gay community as a as a bad thing because I did spend quite a long time just literally walking about on beaches and picking up driftwood and still writing. So I, was, I just needed I think some solitude really, and my parents were were brilliant because they just completely respected my space and just let me just recover really. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, so how long have you been there now? 20 years, actually. Yeah, literally almost to the day, 20 years. Wow. Yeah. Are you there now for the, for the duration? Um, I think so. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I love the idea of, of, of there's a few other places. I think parts of Cumbria are, are very, very special. Um, I'm just going to have to shut the window because the window... Okay, sure, sure. I'll just be just a Oh, sorry about that. It's all just getting a bit more wild out there. But at least you get proper weather here. It's it's never subtle. <laughs> but it's this blowing up a real storm again, I think, which is great. Are you on the coast? Yeah, well, um, I, I used to live for about 15 years. I was, I was about 100 yards from the sea, which was good sometimes, <laughs> not so good at other times. Because during the really bad storms of you know that you get in autumn it'd actually be quite scary because i lived in an attic so you could literally feel everything moving about so yeah. I'm, but I'm in the middle of penzance now so it's it's quieter than that but but it's i think it's it's amazing that there's you still get these little places where ordinary people can still live near the sea but um yeah that's good i want to talk um probably finish off with in fact uh, a little bit about creative ambition and i think i've got a bit of a handle on it from the sort of chat we've had really and also from just knowing you anyway but um rather than just sort of saying what are your future plans i'm quite interested in the scope of your future plans really whether you have an ambition to kind of have more people read your stuff or whether you're happy trundling along as, as you are and that's that's fine like that um i feel much less of a need to be published now i do uh, i do follow a, a fair few people on twitter who are I don't know, maybe just starting out or they've been doing it for quite a while but their their gauge of of how good they are is how much they're getting published or accepted, which is fine. Of course, that's that's absolutely the thing. But I, I'm I know that that mo that doesn't really motivate me anymore. It used to be. I, I just desperately wanted everyone to read stuff. But now I write for its own sake um, because it's I think more part of a a spiritual process. Um, so it's it's more about what the stories do. Although, you know, in the last few months, I have actually been started to submit manuscripts again. Um, which I do actually have some more publishing news, so I've just had another story accepted, which is okay. really good. I'm really chuffed about that. And, and people are asking me now to, to, to send stories to them, which is a really nice position to be in. So I think I want to leave that open. I'm not going to say, no, I mustn't submit anywhere. But I think if... if someone doing an anthology or a project that does look really good, then I'll go for it. But I don't I don't have this massive need to get some a book deal or something. I think realistically it wouldn't happen anyway. But, Do you have any advice for, for people who are starting out doing what you're doing? Um I think that would probably be it is not to not to put 
all your hopes in getting published because if you uh, if you if you're that if you're that desperate to get people to register you can easily put it online start doing putting stories online and see what people think of them um but i think it's it's the writing it's the stories i think that matter so i think just just do it for its own sake and don't don't write and be held back by what you think people will or won't publish mm. because it's really easy to do that i've done that a lot um but that's it just just be honest and, and do what you're doing but being published is really not the be all and end all i think that's the main thing okay and the subject of that you have a website at julietravis.wordpress.com <laughs> thank you i'm not very good at self-promotion <laughs> <laughs> is there anywhere else or is that is that where people should go um, yeah i mean i've got a facebook page but i'm rarely on it these days so I just look for messages and that's it. Uh, and I'm on Twitter, but I usually post little bits about writing, but not that much. So, but yeah, the the blog is the place really to put. Cool. So I'll I'll repeat: Judy Travis. dot wordpress. dot com. Thank you. Cool. Okay, Judy. Look, I'll leave it here, and we can have a little chat after I've pressed the stop button. Uh, but I'd like to thank you ever so much for your time, and um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me.